Hello, this is Sherilyn Smith from the University of Washington. I'm a pediatric infectious disease doctor, and we're going to be talking about two viruses of the herpes virus family that can cause common illnesses in children and even more severe disease in immunocompromised patients, human herpes virus 6 and 7, or HHV6 and HHV7. Here are the learning objectives of this video, to recognize the clinical manifestations of HHV6 and 7, and to outline how tissue tropism affects the disease manifestations of HHV6 infection. As you can see from the course map, HHV6 and 7 are related to other herpes viruses. I will spend most of this video talking about HHV6 because it causes more disease in patients. So this picture shows a 21-month-old girl named Megan. She has had a fever for the last four days that's been very high, up to 40 degrees centigrade, but comes down with acetaminophen. She doesn't have a lot of other symptoms, but really doesn't want to eat and is generally fussy. The morning of the fifth day of illness, her fever is gone, but now she has a rash that's slightly pink and on her arms, legs, and trunk, like you see in the picture. She is now happy and playful. This is roseola, a classic presentation of HHV6 infection. So HHV6 and 7 are members of the herpes vidriae, or herpes virus family. They are beta herpes viruses and most closely related to CMV. Like other herpes viruses, HHV6 and 7 become latent and can cause disease when the virus reactivates. These viruses become latent in sites that are not the ganglionic nerve cells, which is in contrast to varicella zoster virus or herpes simplex virus. HHV6 and 7 are DNA viruses with replication cycle like other herpes viruses. In addition, their structure is similar to other herpes viruses. There are two subgroups of HHV6, A and B, that have different genetic, epidemiologic, and clinical manifestations. HHV6B causes most disease in infants and reactivation disease in immunocompromised hosts. So infection occurs via inoculation of epithelial cells with subsequent primary viremia as shown in the figure. HHV6 uses CD46 as a cell receptor which is widely expressed on nucleated cells. Salivary glands are infected during primary viremia. Persistent and asymptomatic infection can occur in the salivary glands, thus facilitating transmission to others, which is probably why we see such high seroprevalence rates. After primary infection, the virus establishes latency in monocytes, macrophages, and possibly other sites like the central nervous system. HHV6 can also integrate into the telomeres of the host and thus become germline. This is a unique characteristic of HHV6 and can result in vertical transmission of HHV6 from mother to infant. It can also lead to overdiagnosis and unnecessary treatment in some patients because PCR of whole blood or serum will be positive. Scientists are still determining whether this integration is associated with cancer or other chronic illnesses. Reactivation occurs and may be asymptomatic or result in illness depending on whether the patient is immunocompromised. Viral affinity for specific body tissues uh, or tissue tropism is determined by first, cell receptors for the virus, second, cell transcription factors that recognize viral promoters and enhancer sequences, and third, the ability of the cell to support viral replication. HHV6 replicates in a wide variety of cells, including T cells, monocytes, and macrophages, natural killer cells, astrocytes, and glial cells, which are a type of nerve tissue. It can also be recovered from a broad range of tissues, such as lymph nodes, renal, tub renal tubular cells, salivary glands, and the central nervous system. The fact that it has tissue trophism for neural cells can explain why patients develop seizures during primary illness and why encephalitis is one of the main manifestations of HHV6 reactivation in immunocompromised hosts. Other herpes viruses also show tissue tropism for neural cells primarily herpes simplex virus and varicella zoster virus. This virus is, has worldwide distribution and infection occurs primarily in infancy between the ages of six months and three years. 70% of children are seropositive for HHV6 by age two and 90% seropositive by age five. Most acquisitions are with HHV6B strains. The incubation period is approximately 10 days, and transmission is via contact with respiratory secretions containing the HHV6 DNA from asymptomatic contacts. 
Children with primary or first-time infection typically have three to five days of high fever, often over 39 degrees, and irritability. About a third of children have fever and no other symptoms, and one half of children have mild upper respiratory symptoms, primarily nasal congestion. Cervical lymphadenopathy in the occipital region occurs in the majority of children and is more prominent at three to four days of illness. As fever abates, a classic diffuse macular or maculopapular rash, like that seen in the picture, emerges in 20% of patients. This infection typically has a benign course. A subset of patients may develop febrile seizures and rarely meningitis and encephalitis. But what are febrile seizures? They are generalized seizures that are brief and occur with fever. They occur in children aged six months to six years and are not epilepsy. Most people with febrile seizures do not go on to develop epilepsy. 10 to 20% of febrile seizures are caused by HHV6. Reactivation occurs in immunocompromised patients. Approximately 20 to 50% of immunocompromised patients have reactivation of HHV6, with the highest rate seen in bone marrow transplant and solid organ transplant patients. Most reactivations are asymptomatic, but can cause transplanted organ dysfunction, bone marrow suppression, and central nervous system dysfunction, pneumonitis, and hepatitis. So diagnosis of HHV6 is a clinical diagnosis in normal children. In immunocompromised patients, molecular diagnosis, specifically PCR for HHV6 or HHV7, is the test of choice. For primary infection during childhood, we give symptomatic treatment of fever and supportive care for febrile seizures if they occur. Treatment of disease in immunocompromised patients include antiviral agents such as foscarnet or agancyclovir. There are no specific preventative measures. So now turning to HHV7, it is very similar to HHV6. It has both active and latent infections of CD4 T cells and latent infection of many other tissues, including the skin, lungs, and kidneys. There is a high level of persistent salivary infection like HHV6, and transmission of the virus is by contact with respiratory secretions containing HHV7 DNA from asymptomatic contacts. This, like HHV6, is a very common virus as shown by serologic studies, but the acquisition is later than HHV6. Only 50% are, of children are seropositive by age two, in contrast to the 70% seropositivity at the same age for HHV6. The clinical manifestations are similar to HHV6, but if febrile seizures occur, they may be longer or more severe. We do not routinely diagnose or treat this infection because HHV6 causes the majority of disease in immunocompromised patients. So in summary, HHV6 and 7 are common infections during childhood, but HHV6B causes most disease. The main clinical manifestations of infection in children are roseola or fever and no other symptoms. Reactivation occurs in immunocompromised patients and can be asymptomatic or cause a variety of diseases. The fact that there is tissue trophism for nerve cells can in part explain the fact that febrile seizures occur in children with primary HHV6 infection and encephalitis or inflammation of brain parenchyma in immunocompromised patients.